As a brand new mom myself, I know it's a priority for many of us that we pass down our language, our customs, our food, our music, of course, and keep the cultura flowing from one generation to the next. But it's not always easy. So tune into this conversation between several powerhouse mamas as they explore the highs and lows of raising bicultural and even tricultural children. Hi, everybody. This is Elsa Marie Collins. I'm one of the co-founders of Poderistas, and I'm so excited to be moderating a conversation today about powering culture in our kids. I'm so excited for this panel. Um, there's, we were having a conversation before we started recording, and I said, no, no, we need to start, start this conversation again so we can get all the goods. Um, before we kind of get into it, I would love to have everybody just introduce themselves, um, you know, how many kids they have, kind of what they're what what they're doing right now, because I think it's so important to to realize that you know mothering in this age uh, is is a 360 approach. So um, why don't we start with Karen? Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, so my name is Karen Comas. I work at Facebook, and I'm also the co-host of the Motherish podcast along with Pamela. Um, I have a two and a half year old daughter named Victoria who changed my world. I am Karen Psychic at the Motherish Moments podcast. My name is Pamela Silva. I'm a journalist. I've been at Univision for 18 years and I'm a news anchor and I'm the co-host also of Primer Impacto. And I have a baby boy named Ford and he's 16 months old. My name is Tatiana Ali. I am uh, an actress and um, doing some writing now. I'm also a singer and I'm the mom of two boys a uh, five-year-old and a two-year-old. Amazing. And as I said, I'm Elsa and I have three kids, uh, Alessandra and Valentina, who are 13 and 11, and Massimo, who is nine, um, our youngest is a boy. And we really wanted to bring this conversation to the Latinas Make a Difference tour because we know how much, uh, how important, you know, sort of the mothering culture is and the Latina culture. So I just really wanted to kick off this conversation about, you know, studies show that bicultural children who take parts in both of their cultures are more self-assured. And, and I'm just curious for, for, for the people on the panel today in the conversation to talk a little bit about sort of their cultura, where, how that fits in, what, what, what do you consider to be you know, culture, is it language, is it, is it set up? Um, and would just love to kind of kick off the conversation that way. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll start it off. So mm -hmm. again, I'm Pamela. So Karen and I actually had this topic uh, at the Mother's Podcast. For us, culture is very important, but it's also very effortless. I think the, the key point here is to make it part of the daily routine. For us, it's not about overthinking. Um, I mean, it does take a little bit of effort, but I think the minute it becomes part of your daily routine, your day-to-day -day, it kind of becomes kind of like a fun and a game for, for our children. So for us, I mean, we only speak Spanish to the baby in my household. I'm Peruvian. Um, his father's Canadian. So we're doing the one language per parent. So English from the dad when he's at his dad's house and then Spanish from the mom. Um, and it's just at the essence, right? He's going to grow up with the mom having this a little accent. So, you know, so he's going to be around different different sounds and, and different languages, but also just the essence of, of having it around the home. You know, for us, culture is in the language, it's in the food. You know, we eat a lot of Peruvian food in my house. So he's going to be growing up with that. And I think it's just kind of defining and find, helping himself, you know, through the years, identify himself the way he wants to identify himself and just kind of like collaborating and incorporating all the cultures in an effortless way for our children. I am first generation born here. My mother's from Panama. My father is actually uh, Indian from Trinidad. So, and my my husband is very, is like African-American. And so I even have sort of a, a dearth of, of language. I can read Spanish. I can speak Spanish when I go to Panama or when I'm with my cousins, um, but I don't have the fluency that I wish I had because I was one of the American born kids who's like, mom, we're in America. But at the same time there, you know, my aunts, I don't use the word aunt. I say, you know, they're, they're my tias, my tia Marcia, my tia Benilda. Like, my abuela, like I was saying, is my abuela. So we try to, for me, it's 
it is an effort. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a way of, you know, my, my culture and, and the way I was brought up is so formative to me and has given me so much strength in my life, in every area of my life. I want my kids to have that as well. And so in that respect, it's my mom and my aunts that speak Spanish to our kids. And I'll speak Spanish too. I try to not make it. What I realized was that a lot of my correcting was in Spanish because I think that's how I grew up. <laughs> like, so a lot of the things that come out really easily are like, oh, sit down or don't do this or don't do that. Da, 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 da. The food I have down, um, I, I, I cook a lot, but I think also for me, besides language and food is also the values, the importance of, um, of, of family, you know, all for one, one for all that I have found, you know, even amongst my American friends, it's, they're very like independent. I, you know, and, and in the way I grew up, it's more, it's like one for all all for one. If, if there's, there's no such thing as, oh, it's just me. And I have to be about me right now. The entire unit, you know, we, we see the whole family as one unit and that's what I'm really trying to instill in them the most. I think that's, what's given me the most strength. And also growing up, especially going into college, that was kind of like the biggest difference that I saw between the way I was brought up and, and the way some of my friends were brought up. Um, but for me, it is, it is an effort in the sense of, I'm not one generation away now. My kids are two generations away. And so um, I, I don't want to lose that. So I, I even, even in their, their names, you know, my youngest is named Alejandro. My, my oldest baby has my father's name, which is a, an Indian name, Asard. And so even in their names, my name, my middle name is Marisol. So on Fresh Prince, the credits say Tatiana M. Ali. I ended up dropping it because it was hard for people to say. But the reason I did that was because I, I wanted to share who I was. That's what the M meant for me. So hopefully they can look at their names and also they can say their names and also know, hey, wait, I'm connected. I'm like nodding my head with both of the different perspectives because I relate to both of them in different ways, right? So I was born in the US. I'm also first generation like you, Tatiana. My parents are from Peru, but I grew up in Miami. So for me, <laughs> insert Miami girl, right? So like... I was very confused. I didn't realize like there was anything special or particular about me until I got a little bit further along in my career in the corporate world, where then particularly in tech, in my industry, where I was like, wait a minute, like this is this is different. That they're like not everybody's the same way, especially with the family values, especially with that independence and family unit, like you were saying, Tatiana. So with my daughter. You know, she has so many different things all together in one. Um, you know, she's got my my influence from my family, the general Miami influence, right? Like you have black beans and rice and lechon like for Christmas, even though that has nothing to do with any of us. And then, um, and my husband's from Argentina. So there's a whole other mix there. Plus, I think another huge influence in in the identity and culture growing up is also our nanny, you know, like the, you, you invite somebody into your home to help you raise your children. And by default, they become part of um, an extension of family and culture. So she's from Honduras. So you mm. have, you know, a, a black beans and, and lechon eating little girl who also really loves tortillas. Like, <laughs> um, so I think all of those things contribute to, to it, an identity that I think in the future will just help her be a more open-minded and accepting person, um, which is, I think, something that so many of us hope for um, as well for the next generations to follow. Yeah, I mean, I grew up on, I grew up in the border in Tijuana and San Diego, and so first generation, but grew up crossing the border, going to school in Mexico, uh, definitely, you know, feel very Mexicana. We speak Spanish in my house, only my kids go to a bilingual school. I mean, I went to school in Mexico, so so I can't recreate that for my kids, but I try to do it as much as I can. My my husband is black, uh, grew up, born and raised in LA. Um, so like uh, like Pamela was saying, I speak only Spanish to the kids. My my husband speaks English. Um, 
but his his uh, grandfather is Native American. So there's a lot of different cultures that I feel um, I want to have my kids uh, have a connection to. And and like we were saying, for me, probably the primary connection that I feel to, to my culture really is language, which is why I think it's, you know, I, I make the effort to, I mean, I've never said a word of English to my kids in my whole life. Um, and that is something that, that like Tatiana was saying, that's an effort. That's definitely an effort. You're in the grocery store and the, you know, in the airport, it doesn't matter where we are. This is how I communicate with my kids. And, and that's something that I'm very intentional with. But at the same time, you know, I, I recognize that their, you know, their dad is, is African-American and I want them to have that sort of culture and tradition from his parents and, and how, you know, where their family's from and, and from Louisiana and the experiences that they've gone through, you know, kind of coming through the generations in the United States, you know, that's something that, that I didn't have in, uh, an awareness of growing up in Mexico. That's not something that's, that's you know, really um, talked about there. It's more of a socioeconomic sort of, you know, division. And so, uh, so that was just interesting to me. I, I remembered on one of our, our first dates, we went to a restaurant and I had the, the menu out and I was looking and, and my husband said, oh, there are only two black people in this restaurant. And I was like, oh, I, I was just looking, I didn't know what, what I was gonna order, but, but having that sort of, that's how his awareness button works. And so that's something again, that like, as I look at how, how I'm raising my children, I'm trying to say like, there are all these things that I, that I want them to be aware of and to be connected to. And so I think that, you know, that kind of just leads me to my next point about how, like Tatiana, you were saying, you want to, you know, how you, your culture affected those formative years. And, and it sounds like it was, it was amazing. And you want to recreate that for your kids. And, and why do, like, what do we think that that is? Like, why do we think that is? It's a source of strength at the same time, you know, being, being, um, black and Latina or a black Latina, it's there in, in a way. And, and you made me think about this when you're talking about your husband and your kids, there was, there was like, you know, for the black American kids. And I know my mother experienced this in spades because she came here, you know, really only speaking Spanish. She had to learn English here, but, um, the, it, in one way, there were a lot of divisions. Like when people came to my house to eat, you know, the, everything was too spicy. Everything was strange when I brought a friend over, <laughs> like all the food was weird and different. And, um, and so in, in one way there's, there's, there are these separations, you know, with identity. Um, but I think that that's something that we all experience in some way when we're trying to come into our own. So the, the strength that it gave me, I think is, is, is the anchor, it's, it's like an anchor, you know, no matter where I go in the world or what I do in life, I have this anchor that my parents created in our home. I know where I come from. And that is something that um, it is part of, you know, I think our spirit world as human beings. It's, 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 it's what forms us, you know, when we're in troubled times or even when we're experiencing triumphs, anything through life, you always have to have that place where you can come back to and say, I know who I am. I know who I am. Bunk what the world says. I know. Um, why? Because my mother whispered it to me because I remember that song my grandma sang, because my dad stood, stood up for me when people were making fun of me. You know what I'm saying? That That's the strength I'm talking about. Cause I can't, with our children, you know, we, we I very much believe in the, in the prophet uh, kind of uh, metaphor of children, like the parents, life is the archer, the parents are the bow and the child is the arrow. You know, we don't know what they're going to encounter as they shoot forth into the world. But what we can hope for is that we were, we were a strong bow, you know, so that they, we've given them a foundation that they can always come back to. The light is always on. So I guess, I, I don't know if that answered your question as a little metaphoric, but that's how I see it. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, Karen, Pamela, I want to just hear you guys, you know, obviously, you know, Miami, Peru, you know, you guys have 
that line so close to, to the culture that you come from. And, and, and we, as Tatiana said, and, and as I think about it, you know, every generation, like our kids might be moving further and further away from that. So, so being that first kind of connector, um, how do you try to like, sort of like teach them that they then will be the, the connector to the next generation? I think the exposure to diversity that we have in Miami is something that we, not, we do not take for granted. I think it's a gift that we have, it's a gift that our children have. And I, I did want to touch on, on what you said about being intentional, about what are we exposing them to, right? So intention in the way of like, what are we reading to our kids? You know, so storytelling for us is very important. So um, actually Karen gifted me a story about Lima, something so simple as like, you know, a bilingual book about the city or where his mother is from. And just taking the time to kind of read it over and over every day, every day here he gets read Lima. Um, and just those, those small little details that become part of the daily life, but that you're intentional in order to maintain that connection. And like I said, we don't take for granted the fact that we are able to travel back to our country. We haven't because of the pandemic, but it's something that I'm, I'm hoping to do very soon because I think it is important. We do have that privilege. A lot of people do not have that blessing to be able to go back and connect to our homeland. We fortunately do have it, not as often, but you know, when we do, I think it's important to kind of expose them and show them. I think to traveling and also storytelling, like I mentioned, I think it's important and also to keep our ancestral stories alive. I always tell my mom, you know, tell me a story when I was little. Dime una historia, cuéntame algo, cuéntame cuando tú era chiquita. You know, when you were little, tell me something. And, and I'll have my mom tell uh, my son's stories. So I think it's just incorporating the entire family. And if you have a blessing to have, you know, abuelas and bisabuelas that are still around, to kind of like keep that alive to the storytelling. Um, but yeah, but definitely the fact that we have that close connection and the exposure to diversity is definitely uh, a, a plus for us. Miami sounds awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Miami's very nice. Everyone's invited. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think as as they grow and as more time passes, it, it's inevitably going to evolve into something new, right? So, um, even in in terms of like simple language, like I I actually personally growing up was always very confused about my identity, and I would talk about it with my parents. I didn't have any siblings until I was older, so I didn't have anyone to share it with and be like, "Do you also feel this way?" You know, like I don't get it because like. I like, you know, I grew up listening to like, I don't know, classic rock, but also like, you know, salsa and like my, literally my very first two CDs that my dad let me order from Columbia House was a Gloria Stefan CD and um, Ice, Ice, Ice Baby, Vanilla Ice. So it's like, there you go. Like that says it all, right? Two completely different things. And that was the foundation of how I grew up, you know? So with, with my daughter, I mean, truthfully, like my husband is all about his, his country. And, you know, he was in Buenos Aires until he was 13, then left, but has gone back every single year of his life until the last two years now because of COVID. But like, she, she has like three different ways to say strawberries, like all Spanish, but completely different. Um, so I think it's just going to fuse into some sort of new version of culture and identity um, that none of us probably even know what it's going to be like at this point. Yeah, I think you brought up a, a, a point that's made me think a lot about, you know, and, and my kids are a, a little older. And, and so I've, I've seen this in, in the school setting um, and just in their friend circles where like they may be the only sort of like diverse friend of, of their circle, right? They may be their, the only black or brown you know, in this case, are both um, friend and 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 having them feel very comfortable with, with who they are and and understanding, you know, kind of what that entails, which in some cases can be a lot of responsibility, you know, on young kids, especially, you know, after you know during the pandemic and when we had everything happening in this country and everyone just sort of reexamining, you know, the framework of like who we are as people. And so being able to communicate to my kids, you know, who, who are they and, and who are they maybe to other people and, and how important it might be, um, you know, and it, it is a responsibility really for them to, to understand that. And so, you know, sometimes I, I think about that a lot when I, when I think about how I'm raising them. I always say like, I parent them very hard. In this house, we're, we parent very hard. And because I know that, that you know, I want them to be the people who are going to be standing up for things and, and speaking out, you know, or speaking for, you know, sort of like who they are as individuals. So I think that, um, 
what you were saying kind of really resonated in, in that way. And, and as your kids um, start to get older, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. And then the other thing I was going to say is, is this, and we touched upon it with, you know, there's levels or there's a spectrum here of a facility with the Spanish language, right? And, and how do we sort of, um, you know, permeate that through whether, you know, like Tatiana, you were like, hey, I'm in America now, I just want to speak English, or whether it was our parents who might have said, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I really wish I didn't do that. <laughs> Yes, or whether it's the parents who, you know, fortunately, I, you know, I was, I was still at the border. So, but, you know, there's a, a generation around, around me of, of, you know, first generation children who don't speak Spanish because it was all about sort of fitting in. And so, um, so I'd love to hear you guys talk a little bit about, you know, how do, how are we, how do we help parents? And maybe we'll start with the motherish duo. Yeah. How do we help parents deal with maybe some guilt that they might be feeling around? the issue of how of the language so be, before i touch on the language also i just wanted to highlight a point um that actually one of my colleagues brought up is when it comes to storytelling not only are we responsible especially those of us who have a platform to impact other people not only telling the stories of colored children and black children and latino children to our own children but also um kind of teaching the love of our stories to the white community as well, right? Because we want to go ahead and educate and, and kind of raise and, and expose other children to our own stories as well so that more tolerance is, more inclusion is aware. So I think whenever we have a chance to tell our, our stories to other communities, I think it's also very important. Um, and then on language, um, for me, Spanish was always, and even I work at Univision, right? And people always ask me, oh, do people watch Univision because they don't speak English? And that's not the case. People watch Univision because they find culturally relevant content, right? So we're generating, a, a, we're forming a generation also that kind of like wants to be a little bit connected to home and language is a good connection for them. Um, but it is a challenge. I think every mother who has a child that starts school always tells them, speak in Spanish now because when they start school, forget about it, it gets so much harder. And then when you add a sibling to it, they'll communicate in English and then it becomes double, um, you know, the challenge becomes as hard. But um, I, I think in that case, it does take some effort, right? It takes some discipline from the parent. I think you have to lead by example. This is one of those things where you have to really stick to it and be strict about it. Um, but also incorporate in, I always say, in, in, in music, um, in movies, you know, and I always say, including like the elders in your family to kind of speak to them about their stories. The other thing I want to touch on before we we kind of wrap up the conversation is around balance. And Karen, you kind of brought it up a little bit right now around like, there's so many things on our plate, especially, you know, after, during this pandemic, we're still kind of in it right now that that mothers have really had to take on, especially in the Latina community, you know, um, there's, you know, the child rearing, there's the household, there's, you know, if there's a partner with you, like, you know, there's so many things on our list. And there's also so many things to feel guilty about and so many things, you know, to think about. And so, so maybe like a piece of advice that you might have around mothering at this time and, and what has helped you during the pandemic kind of um, be okay. So what helps me um, kind of keep it together and keep going is understanding that I cannot be everything to everyone all day, every day, right? And so I'm very strict and specific about, you know, right now is my time to work. So I'm working or right now I am with my daughter. And so I'm going to be present with her. I mean, she, and if I'm not present with her, she will tell me, mommy, el teléfono no. And I'm like, okay. Okay, two and a half, she's already doing that. Um, bossing me around, which I love, leadership, right? Leadership. <laughs> um, but yeah, so just being very specific about what I'm doing in that moment um, and, and knowing that like that that's the only, because th in the moments where I feel the worst is when I try to do everything at the same time. I'm trying to be a really good wife this week and I'm also trying to be healthy and I'm also trying to be really good at work. And it, no, like I can't. So day by day, almost like hour by hour, this is what I'm doing in this moment and trying to just like cancel the noise for everything else. Um, because if not, we, we end up re being really burnt out. One of the things that I happened during the pandemic, I was doing um, um, a, a, a summer camp that I always do with Black Girls Rock. And it, you know, and, and this was, the, it was a pandemic, so everything went virtual. And I'm sitting at the computer and all of the women putting it together, we all at one point, because it's evening time, had 
the baby here or breastfeed and the babies were there and we're all doing our work, but it was messy and it was real life. And it was, it, I had this moment where I was like, you know what? I hope this doesn't stop after the pandemic in the sense that there's no, this, this, this idea that, um, there can be these like sterile environments where we, like you said, do everything perfectly or do to, that is, that's one thing that went out the window. I mean, if I, you know, if the best I can do is, and I'll call it a caftan to be nice to myself, but if that's the best I can do for the day, but I'm making food for everybody and I did my work and I did some of my work and did it, that's it. If the laundry, okay, I did the laundry that's clean, it's going to sit on that bed for a couple of days. I know that sounds, that's not me either. Like I'm like super tired. <laughs> like I, that's not, but those are the kind of things that I've sort of um, let loose on because the priority is my family's feelings, you know, feeling cared for, checking on my people in my community, like checking on the neighbor across the street who just became widowed or checking on my mom who's, who takes care, who, you know, takes care of my abuela. She's her caretaker right now. And that's a huge stress because nurses couldn't come in during the pandemic. Just prioritizing, I think in a, in a weird way, like the, the pandemic and also the protests that happened last summer, which really, for me and for my family, that, that, that was actually more of a, um, uh, scary, unclear space than even the pandemic. The pandemic became secondary to that. Um, yeah, the the priority shifted, and I and I kind of hope it it's a we're <laughs> I have to say we're allowed, but I kind of hope that that our society is is changed by in that by that in that way that we're allowed to keep those priorities. And especially as women, that we're not, you know, expected to be a mother one, one, in one part of the day and a wife in one part of the day, but then be, you know, in, the, in a corporate environment or wherever we work and then completely become somebody different, that we can be everything that we are like all the time. Um, so striving for that and, and hope, and as, and as, this thing progresses as things change and hopefully, get, you know, get better. Keep it. I hope we keep it. I definitely think we're going to keep a lot of the lessons that we learned during this pandemic. And it was definitely a season, I think, for especially for mothers. So just learn to be more generous with ourselves. I think we're very tough on ourselves. And I think this was a season that kind of forced us to put a break on, on, on our speed, on, on the way that we're handling things, on the amount of things we're handling. Because I think it's, it became more about like, you know, quality versus quantity just trying to like do everything on our own and I think culturally too we're just like raised to kind of be like I got it I got it no no I'll do it you know and we, we tend to micromanage so much and I think this was a season that kind of forced us to put a break and to really value what's important um in our lives and, and like that's kind of mentioned kind of just blend it all in um you know kind of like everything's part like you are the same woman that you are when you go to work and just kind of like become that that real human uh, vulnerable woman in all stages of our lives. So I think it's a lot of big lessons that we're taking from this season. And like that's gonna mention, I hope a lot of them stick around post pandemic. Yeah, I was gonna say for me and for, for anybody who knows me, um, you know, I'm a huge advocate for, for self-care. And for me, that means, you know, physical activity and it's working out. And so that is something that like, you know, during the pandemic, it was downstairs in the bedroom or outstairs for, you know, outside for a run. But I, I never let that go because that was really what, what kept me sane. And so I think that, you know, recognizing that that is, is so important to really do what, what feeds you and what, um, and what is good for you. Um, I think that, that, that Tatiana, you mentioned something right now that I think is like really important, which is around, you know, this, this idea of, you know, during the pandemic and during the, the protests, having people, you know, who in, you know, for, for you and, and for my children who straddle this line of, um, you know, biculturalism, Black, Latino, and, 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 and how do we sort of, you know, go forward? I mean, I always say that, that my kids are 
as black as they are Mexican, they're a hundred percent both. Mm -hmm. And I have to, to advocate for both of those, um, both of them just as strongly, you know, and, and because it's a hundred percent of who makes up of who they are. And so, so I'd love to hear, you know, kind of your thoughts about that. And, and Karen, if you have any thoughts about sort of, you know, being an ally in that space, I would love to hear those as well. I, I, um, I posted some things during, during the protest and I'll, I'll be, you know, it's, it's up on my Instagram. You could see it, but, um, where for me, you know, like I said, my mother's from Panama I, and I don't think I need to be from a place to empathize with people who are suffering. So people who are coming from Central America, you know, um, um, and having their kids taken away at the borders and kids that we can't even find now. At, and that, that to me was completely linked to what was happening with Black Lives Matter. I, for me, I could see it. It was, it, it's a, it's a cultural thing in this country that, that is being shaken up and people are trying so hard, working so hard to dismantle those systems. And I, and I think, um, and I actually got, um, I got some backlash from people who were like, how dare you put those things together? And my question, my thing is, is, well, how foolish is it to not, you know, it, yes, it lives together in me, in, in literally in, in my body, um, those two stories and those two supposedly different worlds. But when you think about, you know, American culture and and what it sends out into the world, what it what it's doing here, you know, there's a reason that I think on a very soul level, there's a that that we're talking about culture and preserving it and preserving it while we're here, because of because because not only is it is it something to to fight for, but there are valuable lessons, values. In, in the cultures that we're talking about preserving here and instilling in our children that we know are sources of strength um, and probably, and, are, and, and sources of strength, not just for us, but in this country period. And I, I love what, what, um, what was said about books making sure that, that, you know, I even thought about this in my own elementary school, I'm doing something with Scholastic with this as well initiatives to get our stories into schools, you know, so that all children learn all of our histories and all of our stories. Um, I, I think we're in a really, uh, a time of, people say upheaval, but it's like a time, it is upheaval, but it's a time of like, it's almost like the shifts are tectonic. And, you know, I, I, I when I, I want my children to to know how to love themselves enough so that the love overflows and you know and they can love others truly for for everything that 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 they are and um um i don't know i think that's the it, in one sense you want to it's a it's a type of armor like a type of spiritual armor you know and in another sense but but why why armor so that they can walk with an open heart and live good lives and 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 feel safe but the safety i guess what i'm also trying to say is that safety is not necessarily like somebody else isn't going to do it like we all have to get together and create those safe communities create those safe environments um and and you know what better place to start than like how we raise our children <laughs> You know. I think that is the place to, to start, right? So I think all, allyship has comes down to two things, um, intention and education. Education, you know, during during the summer with, with all of the, the Black Lives Matter movements and protests, everything, I felt a huge um, responsibility to educate myself, to become aware of unconscious bias that I may be carrying in my day to day and, and, and hopefully not um, transferring those to my daughter, right? So with Victoria, my, my husband and I talked about this so much, like this was, it, the whole summer was like nightly conversations about this. Like, what are we doing? How can we be better? What, you know, and then I would slowly become aware of little things here and there that, for example, things that, you know, maybe my nanny would say, 
oh, like, you know, this, a doll, whatever. Like, she's so beautiful because look, look, she's blonde and blue eyes. And I'm like, hold, hold on a second, hold on, you know, and, and intentionally kind of shift those moments and shift the form, like the foundation that we are all intentionally and unintentionally setting in my daughter's brain, right? So for me, I want things that I look for. For example, when I'm choosing a school, I, I'm intentional about, I want her to go to a school where people are different than her and every, there's a, a variety of everything, right? So that she doesn't feel shocked by anything different as she grows up uh, and gets older, right? I want these things to be natural and normal to her because it is normal until it's not in children. Um, and, and that's what we have to preserve instead of, you know, mold into something else. So, so yeah, I see it as intention and, and education. Amazing. Well, I just want to take this opportunity to thank everybody on this panel, Karen, Tatiana, Pamela, for being a part of this panel, having such an honest and open conversation about, you know, mothering and culture and our kids. And I guess before we kind of sign off, if there is you know, sort of one nugget that you want to leave with our audience um, about mothering or, or kids or or culture that you uh, that you think is is sort of valuable. I, I would invite you guys to share it right now before we say goodbye. I know maybe I should start. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I'll just go off of the theme that that I was saying earlier, which is, you know, um, it's it's very uh when I was growing up you know it was always you know my mom did everything right she was always out there you know somehow five kids we got to school we got picked up we did our homework and now we're you know out in society having our own families and it always seems so like magical to me like oh my god but also like normal and I didn't really realize until I was a mother that I was like wait how did she even do all those things like that's crazy I'm trying to you know and so a I think that um I think our kids would probably think the same thing and have that same reflection but but I would just encourage all the mamas on uh on here to to really take that time for yourself and be forgiving we're our you know harshest critic um and especially in our community and our culture um you know so just go easy on yourself. You're doing just fine. I'm going to add one, one thing. So in addition to go easy, I would also say, just be proud of yourself. I mean, my parents always joke around because they're like, oh, se nos pasó la mano contigo. You're too confident, whatever. And I'm like, you know what? I really needed that confidence in my first two years after Victoria was born because holy crap, that was hard, right? And so now I'm like, I I'm, I'm have this like switch of just embracing the, the joy that it is and the privilege that it is to be a mom, to work, to have a family, to have family nearby. Like, I don't know, just be, be proud of yourself. Be proud of the accomplishments that you, that you do every single day, no matter how small, because we need to hold on to every ounce of that that we have right now. Can I add something to it? Something that just happened to me, like it, it could have been, I think it happened a moment that I had a couple of days ago and then I had it again this morning with my youngest. I, I've done, you know, long-term breastfeeding with both my boys and and he, we're, he was weaned. He got a little fever from a vaccine shot. So now it's like the weaning is going backwards, but whatever. Um, but I was um, feeding him and on my phone at the same time, Cause you know, you, you eat, you do whatever you need to do. And I'm on the phone yeah. and I looked down at him and I caught his eyes and I saw that he was just staring at me and it could be where I am in weaning, you know, cause you go through your own emotional thing. And of all the things that we do, we always do it with our kids in mind, but sometimes just being present with them. Yeah is the most meaningful thing for them and also for us. And it gives you like, when you just sit where they like get to where they are and just share that eye contact and 
you're just there, you're, I know <laughs> and you're just there with them like all of a sudden like you don't feel tired anymore oh. you know what I mean mm-hmm. and you you get energized too and it's so hard to do because because it takes a lot to 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 raise up a little person um but yeah find those moments in the day where you can set it aside and just like be with them I love that so much. Well, thank you guys so, so, so much for your time, for your comments, uh, and for for being here with us at Poderistas. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Marisol Quevedo, and I am a professor of musicology at a school of music in South Florida. I'm one of the few Latinas with PhD in musicology and with a tenure track position here in the United States. And I do research on and teach music of Latin America, um, which is also something that's not commonly taught in schools of music throughout this country. This last spring, I did a special topics graduate seminar on classical music of the 20th and 21st century of Latin America and Latino composers. And my moment of poder came at the end of the class uh, when I got the student evaluations because um, it showed me I was reaching one of my goals, which was mentoring and making sure that students felt cared for and understood and setting a good example and model for how to be an academic uh, with a heart and with kindness and with care. So the, I'm gonna read a little bit of the comment that the student wrote in the evaluation. Professor Cabello is possibly the most gifted and skilled professor at the school of music. I do not state this with any sense of hyperbole. She's very affected at stimulating discussion and leading the class from subject to subject. She has an astounding amount of knowledge, but is also humble enough to admit when she doesn't know about an issue or concept a student mentions in class. She's an inspiration to her students, both within and outside the classroom. Most importantly to the student, she is one of the most human professors of the school. She clearly cares about the personal well-being of her students and against the backdrop of the difficulties imposed by the pandemic this year. She took special care to not impose strict deadlines and penalties on this class. She makes a very real effort to teach, uh, uh, to reach out and connect to her students on a personal level. And that is a most invaluable character trait. That's my moment of poder. (laughs) 